Well, hey, welcome everybody. My name is Oliver Bruce, uh, and I am the host of the Micromobility Podcast. Uh, and I'm very excited to have with me today uh, Kirsten from McKinsey. Hi, uh, Kirsten Heineket. Uh, Kirsten is the head of the Micromobility Centre for Future Mobility, uh, and he's going to be doing uh, what is uh, an update on what is uh, the, the, the McKinsey's view on where the future of mobility is going to be heading. Um, just as a as a primer, I'm really excited for this talk. I've been wanting to uh, see uh, see this delivered for for quite a while. I think McKinsey has been doing some of the best research in this space, um, including some of the research around uh, the shift to owned and and the exciting uh, growth potentials, especially for micro mobility. So, Kirsten, um, if you just take yourself off mute and then uh, get this kicked off. Amazing. Thank you so much, Oliver, for the intro. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. I'm, uh, as I was saying, based out of Germany. So for me, it's sort of the middle of the day. Uh, very excited to be here and very excited to share with you our latest on market sizing for micromobility. Um, I think Oliver did most of the intro already. So I'm, I lead our Center for Future Mobility, our think tank on the mobility disruption. We have a team of around 200 people globally working on nothing but the future of mobility. Not all of them on micromobility, but quite a sizable team here. And I, in my client work, have a combined client portfolio of incumbents, but I'm also serving a ton of startups and scale ups. So uh, very excited to be talking to all of you. Now on the market sizing. So what we've done is uh, we've basically done an update of our model fairly recently. What we do is we uh, start from mobility demand in terms of consumer preferences. We do take a look at how regulation evolves, and then we also do take a look at how technology evolves. Um, and then we put that all together, have a bottom-up model of how mobility works in more than 2,000 cities globally, and we also model rural areas and other parts of countries. And then we piece that together and come to a demand-based model for different types of mobility. And what you can see here is basically the value pool. So if you do attribute a certain euro or dollar value to every single kilometer or mile that is being traveled by different modes, in this case, micromobility, this is what you, what you will ultimately get. And I think it's, it's quite exciting news. So we do expect this market to be growing consistently and constantly over the next couple of years, roughly 9% per annum growth, up to 260 billion US dollars by 2025. Obviously, further growth expected as you roll that out to, um, uh, to future years into the early 2030s. And you also do see that uh, the growth differs a bit region by region. So, for example, Europe is one of the fastest growing markets. Why is that? Because we do see that European citizens actually have a very favorable uh, stance towards micromobility using bicycles uh, and especially e-bikes, but also micromobility uh, as in scooters. Um, much more frequently since the pandemic. And also we expect this to continue going forward based on what we have done as user research. If you then um, do a different cut of the same data, so you will see the same numbers left and right, but you basically cut it by form factor. Uh, what you will see is that there is growth across all of the different form factors, but the growth is slightly different. Um, basically, we do believe that the private e-bicycle is, uh, well, obviously today, but then also continues to be the most significant mode. Um, E-mopeds, either shared but also owned, definitely another sizable mode, mostly coming out of um, uh, Asia, out of Southern Europe uh, and a couple of uh, other countries. And then we also do expect a fairly sizable growth when it comes to all of the shared modes, be that e-bicycle, be that moped, I alluded to that already, but then also the shared e-kick scooter. So I think good news for the entire micro-mobility industry, if you will, right? But we definitely do expect different growth patterns across these modes, depending a bit on, on the regional focus. And then if you were to sort of cut that region and form factor and include it, you would see that some of these pockets, if you will, are growing even more favorably. What are we basing all of our research on? So I said consumer preferences is a very big part of this, obviously. Um, we have an asset, a group of people that do nothing but poll consumers on how they want to use mobility going forward, and micromobility is a big part of that. In this specific survey, we, we did ask uh, how people would actually like to commute from A to B. Uh, and what type of vehicle they would like to use. And you can see that the bicycle is um, in almost all of the markets, the dominant factor. Uh, you can also see that the moped is quite popular, especially in China. And this is also similar pattern in other Asian uh, countries. 
And you would also see a similar pattern if you were to do this for, say, uh, France, Italy, and um, um, Spain. Um, and then you do see that the uh, uh, e-kick scooter is a very limited form factor, but it also shows that there is still room for other form factors, given that, especially in the US, but also in Germany now, as an example for, um, uh, for Europe in this case, you do see that none of these modes really seem to cut it for commuting. So uh, I guess that's where micro cars, mini mobility vehicles, or any kind of form factor that we can dream up comes into play. Moving on to um, some more some more insights and some more data on why people actually choose uh, micro mobility and also um, uh, uh, what they what they prefer and what they like about this. So definitely anything that is e kick scooter, e mopeds, and of course also e bikes and bikes that goes without saying are considered as environmentally friendly. Um, they they also then um, have a clear tendency towards sharing um, micro mobility uh, services. Uh, uh, more frequently in the future. And then there's also a strong satisfaction, at least almost 60% of people like the avail availability of the shared vehicles. Um, there might be a certain bias to that, obviously, when it comes to, um, uh, when it comes to um, uh, urban versus rural availability, for sure. But yeah. And then on the right-hand side, you can also see why do people choose certain micro-mobility vehicles. And you can see there's lots of popular factors, right? From flexibility, price is obviously one, speed, range, uh, experience. And um, I think if you, if you do take a look at this, um, uh, you, can, you can see that there is multiple combinations possible how you can actually achieve satisfaction among users. Um, and that there are definitely different persona groups when it comes to their respective preferences of how to choose a certain mode of transport. Um, Moving on and, and quickly trying to come to a bit of a, of a summary here, right? So what we've, uh, what we've done is we've, we've basically tried to boil it down to the top key five facts of what we see in the micro-mobility market. I think one is strong growth, right? So um, regardless of what value pool you're in, regardless of what mode you're in, this is a great story in our mind because micro-mobility is going to grow across the globe. It's going to grow across form factors, across sharing and ownership. Um, always a bit with the uh, uh, quote unquote caveat that not necessarily all of these things are growing at the same speed, right? So we're saying private ownership, especially because it already starts off from a very strong base, um, uh, be that with a bike in, in Europe mostly, mopeds in Southern Europe and in Asia, but then also other parts or other, other different modes across geographies is expected to grow by factor two, again, of a very, very strong base. So it's a sizable growth. And if we do take a look at shared models, we, we even see a growth of 7x until 2025, which in our mind is massive, and which in our mind will also not be halted by any kind of regulatory discussions that might be ongoing at the moment in cities such as Paris. Um, if we then uh, look at form factors, so not private and shared, but also different form factors, again, e-kick scooters, sizable growth, mostly because we're starting off a fairly small base compared to bicycles. If you do take a look at bicycles, including electric and bio bikes or sort of pedal bikes, you still do see a significant growth, uh, growth 1.5x. If you were to carve out the e-bikes from this, obviously the growth is much more significant. In some countries, we actually see, if we sort of do the breakdown of our market modeling market by market or country by country, we do see that the uh, e-bike is growing 5%, 10%, 15% per year, and the conventional bike, the pedaled bike, the bio bike is actually shrinking. So we basically have a strong shift in uh, the way how user preferences are, are being, being uh, put into the market and how people are buying bikes away in some markets from conventional bikes and into e-bikes. Um, if we then do take a look at um, consumer adoption, and we only picked up one, right? So 70% of global consumers say they would use micromobility for the daily commute. I think great sign. This is growing. So we recently um, uh, polled our um, uh, 2022 survey. So we do an annual survey of different uh, mobility uh, trends. And micromobility obviously is one of the big ones we poll. The results haven't been released yet, but as a sneak peek, the preference towards micromobility is increasing and has increased even more last year versus the other years. So uh, even though one may have made the argument that COVID was sort of a one-time thing uh, with regards to mobility shift and shifting preferences and people shifting more towards micro, we do see this continued and we do expect people to shift their behavior towards micromobility even more. And then last but definitely not least, um, we, we do believe that 
the cities, even though we've had the massive discussions in Europe around Paris and what is happening there, and I'm really excited about what is what the outcome is going to be here. But nonetheless, we do see that cities are investing into anything that is emission free, anything that reduces traffic volume, anything that allows people to pick a, a mode of transport that isn't the personal vehicle. And for sure, all of these regulations, to a certain extent, benefit micro mobility. It doesn't matter if it is an increase in infrastructure investments for bike lanes, reduction of speed limit, um, any kind of policy that makes it harder to park in cities, and so on and so forth. So in our mind, a great story to, for micro mobility. I see Oliver is coming back up on video, so I guess that's my sign to speed up. I'll just bore you with one last page. So, no, no, I was just uh, you're, you're, you're welcome. Keep very going. excited to work with startups and scale ups in the mobility space and very much looking forward to talking with you more about this exciting topic. Thank you so much for having me here. Fantastic. Hey, thank you so, 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 so much for that. Can you hear me, Kirsten? Sorry. Marvelous. Oh, no, look, yes, Kirsten, I was actually going to say thank you for this. It's so good. Uh, you can you continue to go on for a little bit longer. Like we've got a, a couple of minutes in the, in the schedule and I've got some questions here if you'd be up for answering them. Absolutely. Happy to take questions. Yeah, marvellous. Well, look, I, um, uh, one, one question here that we have from uh, 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 Darcy is um, there are many entities related to the future, regarding the future in the evolving markets related to regulations or use preferences. Would you say that, um, what would you say are the most important uncertainties that you can make it, that can make a real difference uh, in the future possibilities of urban mobility in terms of being able to solve it? So I think it's a, that's, that's a great question. I think one of them is for sure regular uh, regulation. So how much are cities actually going to allow or keep allowing shared mobilities? Might there be something happening in Paris that could then create a bit of a domino effect, especially when we come to shared micro mobility and shared scooters? I think that's one. In regulation, the other extreme could also happen that we see cities going even more aggressively against the personal vehicle, especially in Europe, right? And that ultimately leading to even more micro mobility adoption. So I think the whole regulation piece is one. And then when it comes to consumer adoption, I'm not worried about consumers using micro mobility more. Um, the only part that I that I think is, is sort of not established yet is what is going to be the buying behavior? Are people ultimately going to be building up a portfolio of different micro mobility options and putting that in their garage and basically then using that for the respective use cases and during different times of the day and different sort of use cases? Or is it rather going to be a sort of one vehicle kind of one stop solution thing where then, which then would still be massive use, right? But the whole number of vehicles that a household would own is, is uh, would be lower than in the other case. And I think those are two of the, of the uncertainties. I'm not worried, as I was saying, about user adoption and people continuing to buy bikes and buy um, uh, scooters or use shared mobility services. But this whole portfolio and how much the micro mobility is actually going to be. Um, uh, replacing the private vehicle versus being a complementary service is, in my mind, still an open one here. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, we've got time for just one more quick question, which is uh, how would you or how are you categorizing subscription-based models? Are they private or sharing? So in our market modeling, we, we have them carved out, but they are in the private bucket. Why? Because this would be a vehicle that is continuously and always, as long as you have subscribed to it, available to you so it's sort of your personal vehicle right but what we do is uh, we do poll users on whether they would actually like to own a vehicle as in buy it outright right whether they would like to do leasing subscription financing other modes of, of paying for the vehicle but it is part of the private bucket nonetheless uh, as, a, as a small spoiler here or as a small data point sneak peek um, there is a sizable demand for either leasing or subscription-based services when it comes to uh, the private micro mobility consumption and it doesn't matter for which form factor so for e-bikes but also for scooters we see that as a very attractive business model when it comes to user demand fantastic Hey, well, Kirsten, thank you so much uh, for your uh, fantastic. Thanks for having me. Yeah, these Thanks are. This, yeah, this is amazing, uh, amazing data. Like, I think uh, one of the things that we've been really excited about in this space is just finding uh, finding companies that are that are really able to talk to the opportunity and the market opportunity. I think you've done that exceptionally well today. So, thank you uh, for folks who do want to track you down. Um, they uh, can. I, I, I assume they can message you within here, or they can uh, reach out to you. Uh, Absolutely. On LinkedIn, et cetera. Perfect. Yes. Fantastic. Thank you All so right. much.